Hello, and welcome to episode six of LearnerPrivacy.org. In this episode, we talk about surveillance. First thing, most of the time when we end up being surveilled, it's because we wanted to. They draw you in. They tell you like it's a luxury and cool people do this thing. And often it solves a problem. And if you're lucky, you get help solving your problem. Sometimes it solves an organizational problem. Sometimes it's something we force people to use for the greater good. And, and so the, the surveillance is usually not like, oh, let's be surveilled. It is something that you sort of wander towards organizationally or individually. Once they get you in, then they've got a lot of data on you. They, the, there's a couple of different phases that surveillance organizations, those who capture surveillance data kind of go through. The first thing they do is they kind of aggregate it. Um, back when we started having phones and we had maps, they would actually use where you drove to figure out if the map was right or not. So if they didn't have a road somewhere and lots of cars always went there, they might think maybe the map's wrong here. And that's pretty cool, right? I mean, we're all driving around with these things in our cars and we're helping make maps more accurate. Things like Amazon ranking, just aggregate. How, how many people bought this? This is the number four book in Python. Most played songs, just adding all this stuff up it doesn't matter because really we're contributing to the greater good, right? We're, we're helping songs know which, when they're popular or not. Then they move from kind of aggregation where there's, it doesn't really matter so much who's doing it to prediction. Now the key to prediction is you don't necessarily have to know who you are. It's not so critical, but you do want to know attributes. So things like, oh, you might want this book. Or, I've seen your track driving down this route every day around 5 o'clock, and it looks like you might be going home from work. Do you want me to automatically um, just set some things up? And then, at some point, you begin to correlate, right? So there's multiple users. And, you know, at some point, let's just say that you stop for dinner quite often at this place and someone else is driving down the same road, they might you might eventually get an ad for that place, that other person, right? Maybe you should get to know this person. Maybe it's a friend. Now they need to know who you are. But, and that's all stuff that we kind of initially see as valuable to us. But eventually, once they've gone through all those phases, these companies really ask themselves, how do I make more money? Because that's what they do. That's what, that's what the prime directive of companies is, is to make more money. And this slippery slope is inevitable, right? It, it's not like a company can say, oh, I'll never do that. At some point, the management has changed, and the people who would never do that are not there anymore. So let's think about Ring. That's your uh, doorbell that has video on it. I want a Ring, right? Right? I, I want one. It reminds me of England. I feel safe. I feel safer when I'm walking around England and there's cameras pointing everywhere. You know, I mean, obviously we should have some laws about notice and I've seen some ring signs that are like lit all up. Um, it's nice. You can see when packages are delivered. If you're gone for the weekend or away on vacation, it's great. You know, I don't think it's right for me to surveil the neighbors walking their dog because they're just, you know, who knows, maybe somebody's watching that surveillance video and they see one of my neighbors walking their dog and they go steal something out of my neighbor's house. Now, honestly, the local police is not what I'm mostly afraid of. I mean, if they're watching and, and, and you know, they, they see a lot. Yeah. The, the, the bigger fear that I have is how long they hold on to the data, right? And so if you just had a bunch of things where I knew that my ring would be kept for 24 hours by the local police and then thrown away, that'd be fine. But if they're going to just keep it for 100 years, my, my problem actually when I think about a ring is, and the reason I don't have one, is I haven't figured out how to isolate it from the rest of the network. And so this is a network device. And the Ring people can download more software. 
What if the ring people want to download software that actually surveils me in other ways? Right? Because it's got a camera. It's got, it's got a microphone. There's all kinds of things the ring could do. And it could go, like, attack my dishwasher. And so I, I just wish I had a way to completely isolate every one of these little things. Instead of it connecting to my home network, it connects to a little tiny pipe that goes out to the internet. And I might get to the point where I'm smart enough to route my homes that way, but and give like each one of the devices their own Wi-Fi, which is horrible. But do I really want these gadgets on my network? Now, if you think of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, it, it wants to know why you're gathering the data and only gathering the data that's needed and no more. It's called purpose limitation. Use it to perform the function needed and then discard. And that sounds great, but it never works that way, right? No, no one ever thinks to themselves who's pulling in the surveillance data, oh, I've, I've finished my purpose. The answer is, no, there might be another purpose. And so this whole purpose limitation is really a uh, difficult, slippery slope. And so it's easier for them to just say, I'm going to retain all this stuff. And then they do retain it. Um, and they never discard it, and then the company changes hands. And so this is the problem. You don't know what the purpose is. That's the, that's the advantage of gathering and just keeping data, is that you can use it for different purposes over time. So yeah, purpose limitation. Now just imagine for a moment that we were going to write our own ring, and we we're gonna to try to build something that we control that has a privacy at its core. First off, the software in my ring has got to be open source, right? It's got to be upgraded when I feel like upgrading it, not auto-upgraded. Um, imagine that I put some little key inside that software, and if it wants to tell me something happened, it sends encrypts it, and it sends it across the network encrypted. It goes through the cloud encrypted, and it comes to my phone, and it de-encrypts it because I've got the key there, right? And so this data never leaves, it doesn't go unencrypted into some cloud server, it just goes through the cloud in an encrypted way. And I can look at the source code, so I know that they're not changing that rule. Now they might say, oh, we're only using encrypted, but you don't see that software, you have no idea what's going on. If I have software that runs in my house and it encrypts data and sends it out encrypted, then I know, unless that software changed or got upgraded and someone corrupted it, but if it's open source software, it's much harder to corrupt because lots of people are looking at it. But let's just then say, I want to help my local police in case something goes wrong, right? Now, I don't give my local police a continuous feed of my gadget, um, but something happens in my neighborhood, like rarely. But you know what? They say, hey man, something happened in your neighborhood. A cat got lost and we're trying to find the cat. Could I get the video from you from me for a certain time range. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. I don't think anything bad happened there. I'll give you all the video for the last two days. So my, I tell my bring to share the, with the police two days of video and it, psh, they got the video and away they go, right? They didn't get all the video continuously, right? And so doesn't this sound like a cool piece of software and hardware that you'd be happy to welcome into your home and onto your network? Yeah, well, why does this product not exist? Well, unfortunately, it limits future clever ways to make money. <laughs> and so what, what, what venture capitalists worth their salt would bother putting money into my dumb company? Because I can't, like, surveil people when they don't want you to. So that's the problem. We can fix all these problems, but we can't be lazy and we can't let venture capitalists decide who they pay, right? If we just build a thing together, then it wouldn't matter what the venture capitalists want. The venture capitalists want return. So they build us gadgets. Okay. So here's the thing you might ask, you know, I'm so grumpy, right? Who do, who do I trust in the cloud, right? Um, so first off, I am not hiding from the law, right? If legitimate law enforcement wants to find their way into my world, they're going to find their way into my world, and I frankly don't have a right to hide from legitimate law enforcement reasons. So I'm just talking about reasonable privacy, right? Not sort of perfect privacy if I want to be sort of super secret, just, just reasonable privacy. 
So the places that I trust are like Amazon Web Services, DigitalOcean, and Google Cloud. These are my servers. They're my data. Does that mean that the FBI, if it was super, couldn't like peek in them? Probably. The problem is, is if they're peeking in my servers, unless they understand the software that I've got or that I've written, then they just see the data. They don't understand what it means. If if you go to a cloud vendor and uh, and the federal government hooks in with the cloud vendor and the cloud vendor agrees to give them a, a feed, well, the feed is in a beautiful format and it's all organized and ready for the government or whoever is getting that data. I also like things from Apple, Google, and Microsoft. What's cool about these companies is that they are stable financially, they're public companies, and they're not going to sell to Chinese or other investors when things get tough and they're a little short on their cash flow. The things that scare me the most are a small, hungry startup where they're just going to look for money anywhere. And at any given moment, they're having trouble making payroll or they expanded their staff or, 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 right? So small, hungry startups in the early phase are very likely to think, you know, I could add 10% to my revenue just by handing my data to somebody else. A medium-sized startup that's past its prime is also dangerous, and that's because they're so large, and maybe they're past their prime, and it's hard for them to keep their revenue up, and they got like a 250, 300, 400 employees, and their revenue doesn't support that anymore, and they're like, oh crap, I got a, this is a pretty successful company, and it has a lot of data, and then it says, you know what? I can't make money with the product that I'm doing anymore because I'm past my prime, but I can make money with the data. And the worst risk is really a product that was founded with an intent to surveil. TikTok was in the news lately, owned by, some owned by China. It's really not so much about the dancing, it's about the tracking, it's about geo-tracking. But again, the thing that worries me the most is it's sitting and I'm carrying it. I don't have TikTok on my phone, but it's sitting on your phone and they can upgrade it and you just say, sure, upgrade. And that's when that application can change its nature, right? And so that's, they, they've got like a beachhead on your phone that they can change the code. And then you say, hey, I'll give you access to my microphone and my, my camera, fine, right? Do we want global countries not controlled by U.S. laws having tracking data about, say, your child, right? Just because your school thinks it's a good idea and they're not smart enough to realize that this isn't even a United States company. So one of the things that um, we're in the middle of when I'm taping this is uh, the COVID pandemic. And um, some people don't like it, but the, the work that Google and Apple are doing for, for COVID tracking um, I, I'm impressed with it. Now, the thing is, is that I can't write a, Google, a tracking application without compromising your privacy. The whole idea of the COVID tracking, and there's probably work to be done, but the idea is that these phones exchange sort of random changing numbers, right? And they don't say who they are, but you can basically then broadcast later to say, if you got this number, right? So my phone... Here's, as I'm walking around, it's getting a bunch of numbers of people. And I don't know who these people are. I don't need to know who these people are, right? So I've got these numbers of all of the signatures, not the data, not the names, not the Bluetooth identifiers or nothing. But here's this big long list of numbers that represent the last two weeks of phones that I was physically close to. And then they broadcast... Here are 150 numbers that just tested positive for COVID. And your phone simply looks for this match. Doesn't know who they are. Doesn't know when it was. They simply say, ooh, you got two matches of people who tested COVID. And you were, we were near them uh, four days ago. So you might want to go get checked. And so this whole idea, if you engineer it carefully enough, where you're not actually exchanging information and you're not all sending your information up to one, like, cloud authority, um, we can do this. I mean, we, we actually can solve a technical problem in a privacy-respecting way. But honestly, the first 20 people who try it, they're just going to make a central service and suck up all your data and get as many permissions on your phone as they can. And then they can change that to something else. So it can be done, 
it requires dedication and really smart engineers to figure out how to accomplish the kinds of things that we want, the benefits that we want from data exchange without the dangers of surveillance. So I'd summarize by saying that my, my biggest fear is the worst effect happens long after the data is gathered, right? Sometimes, you know, the data will be gathered and just sit idle. And sometimes, sometimes they'll be like fire sales and companies will go out of business and they'll just have a bunch of data from, you know, when they were doing X and maybe even the companies changed what they were doing, but they got this data. So you buy this company, you go looking through all their servers and you're like, oh, wow, that's a treasure trove of information. I didn't even realize they would have kept all this stuff and here you go. And so you're kind of like a data treasure hunter sometimes when you're buying companies. And this is where you gave that data to a company and you thought you had a relationship with it and then it got sold for pennies on the dollar and your data went with it, right? It's not like your data didn't go with it. And, and so that's that's my fear and that's that's why I wish we could come up with things that we could control our own data and then release it as needed for whatever purposes. Um, but unfortunately, there just isn't money to be made that way. Although maybe you could make money, but it's, uh, it's difficult. So I hope you found this episode on surveillance interesting, and uh, we'll see you soon in a future episode. Thank you for watching this episode of the LearnerPrivacy.org podcast.